let's start kind of at the beginning. Um, tell me about the kinds of values you learned in your family and how, how they've helped you along uh, uh, this career in business. Well, I was raised in a, in a uh, s uh, small community on Long Island. I had, uh, when I finally graduated, I had 75 people in my uh, graduating class. My father was the only doctor in town, and it was uh, on the coast in Long Island. And uh, he worked extremely hard. There were house calls during those days. He'd sometimes get paid in clams or corn. Uh, some, sometimes people couldn't pay him. Uh, so he, he just kind of taught me not only the values of hard work, but it, it wasn't relevant about how much money he made or if somebody could pay, but he took great pride in his profession. And, and I think my father was probably my first real mentor. A great role model in terms of personal integrity. He, he had the highest ethics and integrity, and yet he was a great family man. What, what led you into banking? <coughs> I know you went to law school at Duke. What, had the interest always been there? How did that evolve? Actually, it's, it, how, it, the question is how did I get to law school? Because I wanted to go to business school. I was an economic major at Denison. And I bombed the business boards. And I, I didn't know I had bombed them because I hadn't, hadn't had my results. And my roommate was going into Columbus, Ohio to take the law boards. And I had to give him a dry ride, so I took the law boards. I got my business boards back, and I'd done terribly. Got my law boards, ba boards back, and I had the highest score ever in Ohio. So oh, I was off to law school. Uh, but I, I never really wanted to practice law, although I did for several years. I, I always wanted to get into business, and, and as a result, uh, the First National Bank of Chicago, which was my first employer, uh, offered me the, the opportunity to move into the business side. And that was, was very the, fortunate for me. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <coughs> yep. Uh, what, what was the appeal of, of commercial banking? Uh, actually, it wasn't the appeal of commercial banking that, that drove me to the First National Bank of Chicago. It was the only place I got a job offer. But after that, uh, they uh, they uh, they uh, they had started in 1969 when I got there, a venture capital operation, and I turned out to be as a new lawyer in the law department. I turned out to be the person who did all the legal work for the venture capital operation, and that's what really got me interested in in the business side of of what First Chicago did. For our viewers at home, what does a venture capitalist do? What's what's the, what, what's the end? What's the activity? Well, the venture capital uh, business, uh, back th when I first got in started and now, is really providing equity to early stage businesses who probably are too uh, young and too developmental to be public companies, uh, are going to need capital to grow, probably don't have uh, revenues, certainly don't have earnings yet, uh, but, are, but are in an industry which has prospects for rapid growth. So it's a higher risk investing, and, and, and as a rule of thumb, three in 10 venture investments does extremely well. Four or five kind of float around, and two or three uh, go down the tubes. What's the secret to finding the three out of 10 that, that actually succeed? I think it's experience. I mean, you, you have to really focus on an industry. Uh, you can't just kind of do every kind of different industry that comes along. Focus on the quality of the entrepreneurs and have experienced people yourself who, who can provide some value because uh, if somebody looking for venture capital money also wants a, a venture investor that can provide value, whether it's introduction to people in, in the industry, uh, board members that have a significant experience, their own significant experience, additional capital. Um, it's, it's a great business, but it's a tough business. How long, how long were you at First National? I was at fir the First National Bank of Chicago from 1969 till 1992 when uh, we, we spun out of First Chicago and formed Madison Dearborn Partners. What were the guiding, uh, the guiding principles behind this new firm and how, how this has sustained you over the years? Well, I, you know, I think it's a partnership. Um, we, we formed a partnership and we operated as a, we, we, we were the, I, I, I started running the venture capital operation of First Chicago in 1980 as president. And from that time, uh, I hired all of the people that ultimately turned out to be, uh, found Madison Dearborn Partners. There were 14 of us. Uh, we operated as a, as a partnership inside First Chicago. And I think the, the, f the values that, that kept our group uh, together and let us thrive were mutual trust and mutual respect. And I think 
that combined with delegating trust, trusting your people, uh, and and la allowing mistakes to be made, but mistakes you learn from are really kind of the the heart and, uh, of a partnership. What would you define as some of the firm's uh, biggest success stories in terms of uh, uh, entities that you've picked out and said, "This is a winner." Well, most of the real winners have so many hiccups in them that you uh, you didn't. You couldn't be sure they were a winner, but uh, just one example would be a company called OmniPoint, which is which today has, through some acquisitions and and whatnot, we, a thirty million dollar investment turned into a seven hundred million dollar gain. Team uh, uh, OmniPoint is what ultimately is T-Mobile today. That company probably was going to go bust four or five times when we owned it, and that's not uncommon in, a, in skyrocket types of investments. Uh, and it's the question is, um, you know, that last founding, are you going to put more money in and is it going to make it? That's the hardest decision to make. And, and it, you know, it's, sometimes it's, it, it hits the wall and sometimes it hits the moon. You've been at the top of this game for a good number of years here in the city of Chicago. How's the, how's the financial landscape for what you do changed over the years? How's it evolved? When I first got involved in the venture business, there were no investment funds. Um, KKR, which is famous, had just formed their first. I got involved in 1980 as a as, a, as an investor. KKR, I think, formed their first fund in 1982. Uh, my predecessor, Stan Golder, formed a fund in 1981. Uh, now there's there were probably there's probably well over a trillion dollars invested in funds. We've raised 18 billion dollars over the years in funds. It's much more competitive. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, but it's also been successful, and there's, there's been uh, an extreme. It's an extremely ex successful role mo uh, business model. Uh, I've read that you said that uh, just making money wasn't really a, 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 your personal measure of success. Uh, the integrity of the firm and the trust that it builds with its clients and, and investors is, is really it. Could you go into that? A little bit? Well, I, I'd have to say that. My goal when I first got out of law school was to make money. And then after a while, after I made some money <laughs> in the venture business, I realized that really wasn't my primary goal. I think, A, I'd say I had two principal goals, raising of a family with good values and uh, that, uh, of healthy children. We've been very lucky in having, having that have been accomplished. The, the second one was forming a firm that would last well beyond its founders. We didn't name it after our names. We didn't call it. Uh, Canning, Doughton, we didn't want to, to have it symbolized by our names. We wanted to have it endure past our the founders, and, and we've done that. We've created an institution. And I think the values that, that we have of mutual trust and mutual respect uh, uh, has allowed us to be a very strong partnership that should go on for quite a period of time. And I've, I've read, of course, that you're, uh, like a lot of executives of major firms, you take take the long view toward the community that you serve, and you're engaged in a lot of civic activities, a lot of philanthropic uh, activities. Why, why is that so important for a firm that headquartered here in Chicago to reach out into the community and make this a better place to live? Uh, the, you know, the reason I, I get involved in, and now many of my partners get involved in, in cultural institutions, in philanthropic institutions, and in the civic institutions of the community you know we're a large financial service firm but we're, we're a private firm and and we benefit from all of those institutions because we have 70 employees we hire uh, talented people out of business schools if the city isn't an attractive place to come to live and doesn't have a high quality of life uh, the, we're not going to be able to attract these people so we benefit from all of these institutions and we have to support them I mean, it's really, a, a, it's really our business obligation, in, in addition to maybe your own personal preference to do those things. So that's another part of our culture. Everybody's encouraged to get involved in, in, in those kinds of situations. We have a significant involvement in inner city education in our firm. We don't make the people do it. They do it. Well, uh, that leads to the next question that has to do with uh, the Big Shoulders Fund. Uh, now, a lot of people are around this is going to be shown all over the state of Illinois. I know a bit about it from having been up here in, 
talk to folks who are involved with it. What is the Big Shoulders Fund here in Chicago, Lane? What, what does it do for young people? The Big Shoulders Fund is a uh, institution, it's a charitable institution that is separate from the archdiocese that provides support to inner city Catholic schools. Um, it provides scholarships to the children, it provides teacher training, it provides programming and, and, and out of school experiences for them. Uh, it serves schools that are 60% uh, of the, the students, uh, live b families live below the poverty line. There are 24,000 plus students um, and it's been extremely successful, 93 schools. Uh, you know, 60% of, of those, of, out of that group of students, 88% uh, of the high school graduates enter a college within the first year after graduation. So it's a tremendously st strong institution. You know, there are 450,000 kids in CPS. We can't do them all, but the mayor is very supportive of Big Shoulders because he knows it, it takes care of a good chunk of the, of the, the toughest situations. That's got to be something that when you sit down and you see the success stories of these young kids who come out of tough backgrounds and who end up, as you say, so many of them go to college, they succeed in life. What kind of sense of personal satisfaction does that give you to see, to be a part of that? Well, it's very gratifying. My, my fa family foundation provides scholarships to the kids who go to big shoulder schools. We start, we do the high school's four-year scholarships starting when they're freshmen. Our, our, our graduation rate is over 95 percent. Ca I can't tell you how many times, three and four years late after graduation, one of those students will come back and make an appointment to come and see me and say, you know, I, I didn't think about it at the time, but now I'm working for Eaton Corporation and I'm a, a division controller. Uh, you know, thank you. That is a home run for me. And it doesn't have to be every kid that I got, got a scholarship. One in ten is good enough for me. Those are great figures, though, and just the, they'll come back to you, like you say, later. And yeah. They'll, they'll introduce you to their kids and everything, and you, and you see what, what a little bit of an investment up front can do for somebody. Yeah, we, we give 100 scholarships. We, uh, we have 100 scholarships it's outstanding at all times. We meet every, every child before the scholarship, and then we meet them once during the year, and uh, it's, it's, that's a lot of fun. You're, you're engaged also in a lot of the, uh, the other uh, big activities in town, like Museums, uh, like a lot of uh, um, you know, uh, boards of trustees of ins educational institutions, a lot of these places have fallen on hard times in the economy since mm -hmm. 2008. What um, what advice do you give to the charities, to the big institutions, to to so that they can actually show value, show mm -hmm. worth that they're worthy of investment? Uh, uh, one of the big issues now that, you know, especially since 2007, 2008 kind of uh, financial market turmoil and subsequent recession, a lot of the charities that, that, that existed, especially the ones that didn't get, get a lot of government funding or, or had government funding disappear, had, had very tough times. And, and, the, and what we learned, especially at Big Shoulders and some of the other institutions I'm involved in, is you have to m measure your outcomes. And you have to be able to d demonstrate to donors that your outcomes are achieving what the gift is intended to achieve, whether it's graduation rates or feeding homeless. Whatever, whatever the mission is, you have to measure the outcomes. Younger donors now, especially in the technology world and, and in Chicago, get more involved with their donations. And they want to see outcomes. They want to. They they're not just going to make donations to 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 worthy causes. They're going to make donations to worthy causes that are that are accomplishing their missions. Most important thing. You said a little earlier something about knocking a home run. I, I understand your interest in baseball. I am an interest in baseball. So how does a White Sox <laughs> get involved in trying to buy the Cubs? Well, uh, you don't get many opportunities to buy a, a, be the lead owner of a, a major league baseball team. I'm a minority owner with the Milwaukee Brewers, so it was even crazier. I was a minority owner of the Brewers, a White Sox fan, and I wanted to buy the Cubs. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't bid high enough. We did, or my group didn't bid high enough. My good friend Tom Ricketts owns the Cubs. He'll do very well with it. I wish him well. I just hope the Brewers beat him. What do you, what do you love about the sport? You know, uh, I love baseball. I played it. Um, to me, you know, my fans, my friends of mine that say, uh, 
you know, I, I don't get baseball. I don't like baseball. I said, you know, then checkers is the right game for you. I like chess, and I like baseball. There's so much strategy in baseball. You know, if you watch baseball uh, d during every, every week, you'll see a play you've never seen before. You'll see a rule or a call you've never seen before. Uh, it's a relaxing sport. It's a great sport to bring your kids to. Um, it's, there's just, it's summer. It's, it's a wonderful sport. It's, it's, a, it's a big time for you and pastime, right? Yes, it is a great pastime. Um, we're getting kind of up toward the end of my questions. But, uh, one question I always like to ask is, you know, looking back on your career, what, uh, what has given you the most personal satisfaction out of what, all the things you've been able to accomplish? I'd say um, it, professionally it would be seeing uh, all the founders, ha not one of the founders, the 14 founders, uh, left the firm for any other reason than to retire. We've had, a, 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 and the, the six founders that remain are still going strong and none of them will ever leave. So it's an amazing thing to have 14 people that you built a firm with that will spend their whole careers at that firm. And, and, and now that I'm not CEO anymore, to watch my successors who have been a CEO since 2008 do such a fine job, uh, it, it's, it's, it's kind of humbling and it's kind of, on, a, on, a, on another note, kind of sad to realize I don't need you, but it's also rewarding. For you personally, what's, what's next? Uh, well, you know, I'm still chairman and I still come in every day and I'm never going to retire. My wife has made that clear that there's no spot for me on weekdays. So uh, I'm going to continue to do this. I have investments in six minor leagues teams also. So I get to try and see one of those each year. And I have this, so I'm chairman of the Museum of Science and Industry and I have still the charitable stuff. So I've got enough to keep me busy. Uh, and I don't, don't plan to slow down. Understood. Uh, when, you, when you heard that you the Lincoln Award. I understand it comes in a really beautiful, beautiful. envelope and there's kind of a sense of, wow, what's this? What, what was your reaction when you found out you were going to be honored? Well, uh, I, I remember that when I found out who the, my fellow laureates were, I was absolutely sure there was a mistake. Uh, then when I saw the past laureates, I was sure, absolutely sure there was a mistake. I'm glad there wasn't a mistake. And once I get the award, it's done. They can't get it back. No, I think I think you're good. Well, thank you. Well, you're you're a blast to talk with. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>